morning and welcome to First English Lutheran Church. We are so glad you are with us today. Today is July 4th, Happy Independence Day, and it is our sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time. So I'll invite you now to take a deep breath, to center your heart and your mind, and prepare yourself for worship. And we begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have not done done, we have not trusted you with our whole heart, we have not loved one another in deed and in truth. In your compassion, forgive our sin, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our light and our truth. Amen. With joy, friends, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn is number 632, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. And we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. Thank you. 
The rates be for 13. No. Pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Now give us courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors transgressed against me to the very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn, and I am sending you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know there has been a prophet among them. This, friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know, but God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except for my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will be not a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I will refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. So therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would lead me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for the power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do, and he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their, un, at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching, he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals, and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet, as a testimony against them. 
So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. So if you can remember the last time I preached, you'll recall that I referenced Rembrandt's The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. I hope that I reminded you that every time we hear these gospel stories, we are picturing something in our minds about what it was like to be there. If we were all fantastic painters, we would all paint a slightly different picture. Unfortunately, in my own case, I'm not much of a visual artist. So I rely on the works of others to help stoke my imagination. So today, for the Gospel text, I went to the Italian painter Duccio di Buonsigna. And yes, I did have to look out how to pronounce that. Duccio is considered one of the greatest Italian painters of the Middle Ages. He painted Christ Preaches the Apostles sometime between 1308 and 1311. Painted on wood, the piece depicts Jesus and his disciples in a very small room together. Jesus is seated on the left side of the painting, set apart from the disciples, who are huddled together on the right side. Considering that Jesus had just felt the sting of rejection, it is interesting to picture Jesus in this intimate setting with his disciples. There has perhaps much that could be emphasized concerning the humanity of Jesus in this moment. The resonance we might feel when we remember the times we have been rejected by others. The grief that results. However, this passage can be challenging in other ways as well. Mark's Gospel seems to link the rejection of Jesus from others to the resultant reality that Jesus could do no deed of power there. The detail of Jesus' amazement at their unbelief further complicates the story. Did Jesus go into silence here because he was feeling discouraged or crestfallen? Which would certainly be a natural reaction. I know I have responded that way before, when in a moment of vulnerability I have presented myself as I am and been rejected. And this is especially painful when we are rejected by those who know us, when friends and family within our own community suggest our own self-expression is misguided and instead encroach other identities onto us, often those identities that are meant to suppress the one we're trying to express, making it seem irrelevant, troubling, or even problematic. Or, on the other hand, is Mark's Gospel trying to sort of save face here with Jesus by suggesting that Jesus wasn't just emotionally wounded, but that the absence of belief on the part of others impeded the power of God? But this is a curious thing, and it could easily send us down a number of rabbit trails of such quandaries concerning how to measure belief or thoughts on free will, or what have you. And even the other Gospels, aren't sure what to do with this passage. For example, Matthew's Gospel tells the same story as Mark, and yet reads, Jesus did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief, which changes our impression of this passage a bit, making a bit more palatable, perhaps. However, I, I think it's important we really focus on this perplexing connection that Mark's Gospel makes between Jesus and these people of his hometown, between their unbelief and Jesus, unable to express who he truly is. As is often the case, commentaries offer little in terms of clear answers and agreement. One commentary I read, however, discussed the dynamic of masculinity present within Mark's Gospel. Expressions of masculinity in first century Palestine were in some ways very different than in our culture today but similar in the sense that masculinity was performed. So far in Mark's Gospel, Jesus has healed illnesses. He's cast out demons, raised the dead, calmed a storm, and contended with religious leaders. All this demonstrating that Jesus is God's agent in the world and has authority that is much greater than any who have come before. 
Jesus is also a man. So the relation between Jesus' humanity and expressions of masculinity is important to consider, especially in this story, primarily because I think it helps uncover an often unspoken impression that we might get. That is, in this story, Jesus appears weak. But in our reading from 2 Corinthians, Paul has something to say about weakness. In a typical Paul fashion, it can be challenging to understand exactly what he means. But one thing that is often consistent with Paul is a sort of dualistic categorization that the reality of Christ subverts and displaces into a new paradigm. Paul does this here with the dual concepts of strength and weakness. His understanding of power, what it is and how it functions, is upended because of grace. Paul speaks of boasting in his own weakness here, and yet I think he is someone we would often view as being strong. He endures many hardships in his travels to proclaim the gospel. He is determined, intelligent, and authoritative. Yet he is brought to this realization that he, a strong man, must rely on the grace of Christ, a weak man, who gives this grace freely and sufficiently, for power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, it is not simply a redefining, as what once was deemed weak is actually strong, and vice versa, but that in the Incarnation, Christ realizes a new way of being, a new creation. That is, one that is beyond the, u- the usual paradoxical cycle of the strong oppressing the weak, and so we flip the participants, so now the previously, previously weak can be strong, but we leave that paradigm intact, oppression begetting oppression. Christ moves us into a new way. We see this even in our gospel story. Why does Jesus go into silence and instead send his disciples out? Jesus felt the sting of rejection, and this brought the impression of weakness, and yet Jesus saw it differently. I think Jesus saw what many theologians refer to as the sin, that is idolatry. Luther defined idolatry as being about trust. What does your heart trust in? Luther asked. This is a good definition, but I would like to add a little more to it today. That idolatry is sin because it requires that we debase ourselves. We lower our dignity in order that the idol might bring us all manner of goodness, rather than relying on God. Jesus was rejected by the people of his hometown, and this brought pain. But rather than debase himself by by attempting to win their belief, Jesus sends the disciples and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And we read how they cast out many demons. Indeed, power was made perfect in weakness. I wrote this sermon in the month of June, which is Pride Month, a time we recognize not only the oppression and suffering of LGBTQ plus people throughout history, but we listen to their expression. We believe their voices. People who have been made to feel weak, who have been forced into the reality of self-debasement, The grace of Christ is sufficient, though. Like in the depiction of Duccio, Christ shares that space with them and gives them authority over every unclean spirit. Because indeed, in Christ, we are a new creation. Amen. It's there. Our hymn of the day is number 756, Eternal Father Strong to Save, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
proclaim our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us come before the triune God in prayer. Heavenly God, you are the one we lift our eyes to. Have mercy on your church throughout the world, as we have not honored your prophets. Awaken in us the belief in the one who saves the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly God, you are the one who ordained the stars and the moon. Provide for us starry summer nights that we can gaze upon and wonder at your creative power. Safeguard all those celebrating and traveling this holiday weekend. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly God, abide with all those whose souls have had more than their fill of the scorn of those who are at ease. We pray especially for the Uyghur Muslims in China. Ensure all the world hears their voice of suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly God, Jesus felt rejection from those who knew him. Give courage and hope to all those who feel the sting of rejection. Give them remembrance of their dignity as human beings made in your image. We pray especially for immigrants and LGBTQ plus people all around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Heavenly God, your grace is sufficient for First English community. Teach us how power is made perfect in weakness. Embolden us with the grace of Christ that creates strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Heavenly God, you are present with the dying. Let their stories find expression in those who survive them. We especially thank you for all those whose lives were given for the cause of freedom throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. He took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and on this meal, as grain scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we receive from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 763, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. And we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4.
bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.